actually, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pass them out uh, right after the first exercise we'll do. <laughs> so um, you should all have now, uh, or soon at least, have a small little thing um, that gives you a, an IP address, a, um, a username, and a password. That, um, for, for doing these, this first exercise, we're gonna kind of go really quickly through it. Um, if you wanna follow along, uh, do so. You can log in uh, using SSH in your terminal, or if you happen to have a Windows machine, uh, you can do it using PuTTY. Um, we're gonna go really quickly first through the first exercise. Uh, Hugo here is going to be typing along and uh, you can do it. We're, it's gonna be a lot of typing. If you get it wrong, don't worry about it. Um, it's not a big deal. We basically just wanna sort of show how you deploy a, uh, a regular Swift node using the command line. And so uh, you're gonna wanna prepare your laptops and be ready with a terminal um, for that exercise. The SSID should be, what is it, OpenStack Hong Kong? What is it? Um, it says on the back of your, your, um, your tag. And the, I know the password is Havana13. Yeah, OpenStack Summit HK. Yeah, OpenStack Summit HK, and the password will be Havana with a capital H, and then lowercase a, v, a, and a. One three. Yeah, Havana thirteen. So obviously, if you want to, if you want to follow along, uh, you're going to need the internet access. Um, once we're done with the first exercise, uh, what we will do is we will go ahead and do uh, a second one, deploying uh, Swift using SwiftStack. And, uh, but before we do any of that, uh, we will go ahead and do a little bit of um, a Swift overview and how it works. So how many here actually knows about Swift? A few people, great. How many people have actually deployed Swift here before? One, awesome. Okay, so, uh, what is OpenStack Swift? It's a uh, reliable, highly scalable, and hardware-proof uh, object storage platform. Uh, background on it, uh, if you've been here today and followed the tracks, Rackspace was the sort of inventor of Swift and they uh, committed it to OpenStack as part of the, uh, the first release. Um, now, what is SwiftStack? Um, we're a company dedicated to OpenStack Swift. Um, we provide uh, OpenStack Swift software, uh, being able to do a controller and managing your entire Swift infrastructure with our controller. It's, it's really simple to deploy this using the Swift Stack uh, controller. And underneath, on all the nodes that we deploy, it's just OpenStack Swift vanilla version, just like you would get it from the open source repositories. So back to this, the, today's agenda will be kind of packed, so um, we're gonna go through pretty fast, and if you, if you have questions, um, please keep the questions to afterwards. Uh, because we're probably not gonna be able to answer questions as we go along um, too much. Uh, we'll be here after the fact and we can stand outside and we can take your questions as you want. Um, if you happen to get stuck during the exercise, just raise your hand and one of my colleagues will come over and try to help you. Um, if you can't finish it up by the time we're done, we can do it afterwards uh, as well. So, uh, sorry about that. Then, uh, so we're gonna go through the Swift basics here. We're gonna deploy Swift uh, at very high speed on a node from scratch. 
and we are then going to go ahead and do it with the Swift Stack controller, as I mentioned before. All right, Swift basics. So as you may know, this is an all HTTP um, access. They use an HTTP API to access all the objects in the object store. Um, Swift relies upon something called the ring. Uh, there's a ring for the accounts, the containers, and the objects. Um, there's also a concept of something called partitions. The partitions are not the kind of partitions that you're maybe used, used to on a, on a disk, uh, on a regular Linux system. It's more kind of like a directories on disk that uses a, a hashed value to, to map data across the cluster. Um, the way you make that happen is you use something called a ring builder. The ring builder um, is a, an application in Swift that builds the ring and we use that to push out the uh, configuration to the cluster. Uh, and then every time you make a change, like you're adding a node or dropping a node or ad adding additional disks, uh, you, you regenerate the ring and you push it out to the cluster to re redistribute the data across the cluster. Um, and the data is also sitting, is also always, always on three different disks throughout the cluster. So there's three replicas for durability. Um, the OpenStack Swift HTTP API works, um, as you can see at the standard URL up there, it basically is a regular URL like you would see in any browser using uh, a web application, and you can access files that way. Uh, it maps it into account, container, and object. So if this was uh, Jane uh, had an account, she would have Jane Doe, and she would have a container called documents maybe, and in that container she would have a file.txt with something in it. What's really important about this notion is that this is not a block storage device uh, or a block storage system. It's not a file system, it's an object system. It only speaks HTTP natively. Um, so what you get is basically an HTTP call into the cluster, and then everything that go gets mapped inside the cluster is still speaking HTTP. So the ring creates the, um, the account container and object, and it shoots off these three, once it hits the proxy server, it shoots off three different copies to storage devices inside there. And the partitions are then mapped on the disks, and data gets spread in the cluster over these different partitions. So <clears throat> basically, because you have a lot of different partitions on disk, those partitions can then be uh, what is actually what's getting moved around. It's not the file itself, but a partition. Because if you did it per file, if we're talking about billions and billions of objects, you can't really, it will take too much overhead to track all that. So what gets moved is actually the partition itself, and that partition gets hashed. So it's checked via an MD5 sum. And if the MD5 sum matches from disk to disk and between the partitions, nothing happens. But if there's a change, it will actually be replicated and moved and make sure that the three copies of everything resides in the cluster. So, the one cool thing about Swift is that you can actually use different size disks if you want. Um, so let's say you start out with two terabyte disks. Now, a year later, you actually have three terabyte disks, and you can deploy using those. That's obviously going to be cheaper, so the next time you add another node, what you can do is you add the disks, and you add a weight. That weight, we typically recommend using, uh, so a two for two terabytes, or three for three terabytes, and the partitions then get evenly uh, distributed across these different um, 
across this different disk depending on how many partitions and the weight of the disk. All right, so how does this all really happen and gets put together? Um, the builder database, it's kind of like a lookup table. Um, it tracks all the different devices, being the, the disks, over time. Um, and it contains all the data so that deterministically it can place the object in the cluster uh, based on the partitions. Um, so when, when the ring gets built, it gets pushed out to every single node and lives on every single node. And it gets checked so that that ring is the same on every single node out there. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there is a ring for the account, the container, and the object. In, in the first exercise we'll do, uh, you'll notice that the ring gets deployed on the node. And uh, if you had many, many nodes like that, you would have to do the exact same thing, make sure that that ring gets distributed across the cluster. Because if you don't have a, the same ring on different all the different nodes, you're going to have, end up having problems. Uh, with a Swift stack solution, we manage that through our controller so that that ring gets pushed out. Once it's out on all the nodes, it gets flipped over and the new ring gets deployed. All right. So the number of replicas. Um, the ring builder settings takes three different parameters. It's the number of replicas, which typically we recommend to use three in a regular cluster. Uh, that's a value that can be changed depending on your needs. Um, but three is typically a good value to use. The number of partitions, um, the rule of thumb here is about 100 partitions per uh, or times the number of drives that you think you will ever have in your cluster. That's kind of a hard question. Like how do you actually know how many disks you're going to have? Uh, Maybe you know because you're only going to be running a backup case, or maybe there's some finite number of uh, files or objects that you will be storing, and you can figure that out. But, um, but generally speaking, it's probably better to go a little bit above what you ever think. If we're talking petabytes, uh, obviously it's going to be pretty big. Um, and then you take, so you take the 100 partitions times the number of drives that you think you will have, and then you round that up to the nearest power of two. Then during the life of a Swift cluster, your partitions, uh, because you always want to make sure that you have availability and durability of your data, you don't want to move the partitions around uh, too much because you will suffer availability problems. So therefore, there's something called min part hours which describes how fast or how often uh, partitions can move in the cluster. Basically, what we want is to have two partitions uh, to always be the same and be static. So there's only one allowed to be moved based on some number. That number is typically a 24-hour default. Um, so the, what, that ha what that does, it helps ensure that there's at most one replica of data being moved in the cluster. That means that if there's a call coming in to get an object, in the worst case scenario, that call will always find two of your, your, your identical replicas. The third may have moved, but all the other ones will still be there. So that way, the availability is, is ensured in the cluster. All right. so. The rebuilding and redistributing partitions. In this example here, uh, we have uh, three disks. We have four partitions on each disk. Now, if we grow the cluster, so we add another disk, uh, we have to rebalance it, like I described before. Rebalance it will basically move the partitions. So you add a thing, an another disk. And from the first row there, you'll see the four partitions. Now you will have three partitions across four disks instead. OK, the three replicas. So when a client uh, requests um, or puts in a, 
uh, an object, what will happen is it will hit the, the black box here, which represents a proxy server. And the proxy server will then put three different replicas into the three different disks. What happens here is before the writes are going to be considered successfully written, the object servers will have to respond with two OKs. Basically, it's called a quorum, and it's really a majority of the number of replicas that you have. So in this case, with three replicas, we would have to have a quorum of two. That ensures that there are at least two different objects written to different disks in the system. And even if the third weren't, wasn't successfully written, over time, replicators and auditors will go through the system and place that third copy where it's supposed to be. So, well, what happens if a drive dies? Luckily, they figured out this thing, and there will be handoff locations that are de deterministically put into the system. So if that disk dies that where it's supposed to go, what happens is the, there are at least two or three different handoff locations where that disk will be or that object will be placed until the disk or the ring has changed and the data will then be replicated back to the third. So you'll, then you have your three different, um, your three different uh, or objects on three different places. So here's another example of of partitions, and in the first row here, we have six different partitions. One disk dies. The replication will move partition to handoff locations, and those partitions will then end up on the different nodes, so it's kind of the opposite uh, of what we saw when we were adding disks before. All right, so, um, does everyone have one of those little tags now? All right, cool. So Hugo here is going to log in. Can you see this OK? Someone can't see it? So-so? Does it help if you make it a little bit bigger, Hugo? Yeah, can you? The contrast is not good enough. Fuzzy, maybe? Yeah, maybe the focus is a little off. Probably the other way. Well, there you go. That's better. Yeah. Thanks. Can you make the text white, maybe, Hugo? Yeah, the foreground is foreground black. Yeah. Foreground there. Yeah. Yeah, let's drag it up to white, all the way to white. Oops. Better? All right, cool. OK. First thing you want to do is you want to SSH into your, uh, to your node. So that should just be uh, demo at some IP address. The password should just be password. All right. This virtual machine that we have in here is the latest Swift, the Havana release. Uh, 1.10. Um, this is a VM. It has five uh, disks. They're not, they're virtual disks in this case. Um, we have already installed Swift on this. So the, so the Swift package is already installed. However, we haven't done anything except for preparing the Swift config file. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to go and take a look at what the file system looks like. Now, this is going to be a lot of typing, and Hugo has done this a lot of times. If you, when you're done and you can show the last step of this ready, raise two hands. First person that can show that they have it running will get a SwiftX t-shirt. <laughs> All right, this is going to take about 15 minutes, hopefully. Ready? Go. Or did that. Okay, so take a look at the, uh, 
the file system, you can take, uh, just go into the, do a df minus h. You can do a block id dash o list, and you'll see the different uh, drives in the system. Once you're happy with that, um, go in and make yourself root, sudo su. It's uh, password is sudo on this one, so it's fine. Now, on after that, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to format the drives, make uh, XFS file system, uh, set the size to 512. You want to label the disk D1 through D5, uh, and uh, you will see that they're, the way that the disks are laid out is dev slash mapper slash v, x, v, d, d, and so on. Be careful here. If you mess it up when you type, you're going to have to redo everything and figure out where you went wrong. Afterwards, if you want to make sure that you're all good, you can run the uh, block ID minus O list again. All right, so who goes moving along here? Once you go through these motions and type in the different things, you will see the same output that, that Hugo's having here. So all this is doing is formatting the drives, putting a label on the disk, and for convenience sake, we're mapping it to D1 for disk one so we can keep track of all this stuff in Swift. And later on, you will see that what this does is uh, it maps into the ring and everything. So, all right, who goes done? I'm moving on. Now, what you're going to want to do is you're going to do uh, make a few directories here, and you can do that using the makdir minus p. And what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to mount those drives at locations that map to the different disks. So uh, we're going to do that at slash SRV, slash node, slash disk one, and so on. We will share this with you, this presentation, so you can go through it again if you want. Um, once we have created all the directories here, uh, Step two, that's cheating, because now we're going back. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we have a better solution for that. <laughs> All right, so uh, once the directories are, are done, you're going to have to mount those drives uh, that we created before and put them onto those mount points. All right. Let's see, where, where's Hugo here? Oh, yeah, he's almost done. So last thing here, at the bottom, you're going to have to make sure that Swift has the, uh, the proper permissions. So what you will do is you will change the ownership uh, to Swift for all, the, for all the different mount points. All right. And Hugo was helpful here enough to to do an LSLA on the SRV node directory, and you can see he's got those directories mapped in there. All right, now we're going to create the builder files. So hopefully you got this sorted out. Um, what? One more. Okay. Someone, someone's getting ahead of you here. Ten seconds. All right. Uh, what you want to do next is you want to go to, to change directory into Etsy Swift. Once you're there, you're going to want to run the ring builder command. Um, there's something called an account builder, a container builder, and an object builder. Remember, we're talking about having uh, three different rings. And you're going to run those commands, and you're going to create them. So 14. Is going to be the the partition power here that we're using. Um, three is going to be the number of replicas, 
and the min part hours that we discussed earlier, uh, that's going to be uh, the one in this case, in this example. So once you have that done, you're still in the etc swift directory. Now, we can run a lot of tons of typing here to, to actually get this done. But to do this, we're going to do a quick little uh, for loop here to make that happen. So basically, you will take all the object, container, and account, and you will map that to the different disks into those. And then you'll run the ring builder, uh, which will then map that into the, the node that we're running it on, which is just the local host, so 127. 001, and the standard ports of Swift, which is running 6,000 to 6,005. Um, and then it's going to run that uh, until it's done. Ten staring at the screens. I like that. Just type it exactly like it says. <laughs> Where are we here? Hugo is almost done. Warnings? You shouldn't have warnings in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, so, um, so while we're waiting for this to happen, well, I'll give you a few seconds. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the, something that we didn't really touch upon earlier, which is there are zones and there are regions. Regions are essentially super zones. Uh, they're physically separated. Zones are t generally fault domains. And a fault domain you can think of as being uh, a rack. You may have a top of rack switch. It'll be a w single point of failure. And you'll maybe have 10 nodes in that, in that rack. If you, if you do that, you would probably want to consider that rack one zone. Uh, if you happen to have Swift over multiple data centers, uh, they would reside in different regions. And that's what we call global clusters. And uh, that would ba basically make multiple regions with different hardware act as one large cluster. All right, here we go. Okay, last thing we want to do is we actually want to run the Swift Ring Builder. get this all created. And you will see that this will output some more data across your screen. And it will run the balancer. There we go. Good. Okay, last thing here, we want to make sure that we rebalance the rings. And <clears throat> you notice that we have to do this for every single ring that we create, the account, the container, and the object. And as, as you do this rebalancing, uh, the balance should go to very close to zero. All right. Now, once you've done that, run an ls um, for, for uh, star.ring.gzip, uh, and then you should see rings having been created, account, container, and object.
Okay, last thing we'll do here now is to we'll start Swift. And you do that with a Swift init command. And um, here we're using restart. We could have used start, but uh, restart safe. And if you're interested in looking at what that looks like when Swift starts, you can do, you can tail the Swift all log. And you can see a bunch of stuff happening. All right. Hopefully you all have uh, your Swift node up and running at this point, and it's actually started. Um, with Swift comes a command line client called uh, Python-Swift client. Uh, it's installed here. And if you want to take a look at uh, or upload data into your cluster, we've conveniently placed a, uh, an image in your home directory. So if you cd home slash demo, you can take and upload an image that we put in there using the Swift command line client. What you will do here is you will take, uh, you'll type Swift U for user. We've created an admin user here already for you. Uh, so you can use admin colon admin. Uh, there's a password, which is the minus capital K, which is just admin. Uh, we have uh, minus A, which is the uh, auth URL for the, for the cluster. And here you're just going to auth against your local host. So HTTP 127.0.0.1 slash auth slash v1 and upload cats cloudcat.jpg. What that does is it will upload into a container called cats the image cloudcat.jpg. Now, we haven't really created the cats container yet. It will actually be auto-created when you, when you run this command. And once you've done that, if you want to list it, you can go ahead and do the same, rerun the same command, but at the end you run list cats, and that should output cloudcat.jpg on your, well, if you're ready. <laughs> uh, so last thing here is you can download the cloud cats again. You can go to another contain or uh, another directory or something and download it. Once you've done that, you've done Hugo. Yep. Now you can make the container world readable. And you do that by basically posting to the container, the cats container, and what you do there is you're setting the ACL on it to be readable by everything, by everyone. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to open a web browser and then take the lower part there and input your VMIP, the public IP that you SSH'd into, and hopefully you will see an image there. Uh oh. Can someone take a look? Help her? A tool over here, second row. Did anyone get it? Have, did you get it? Did you get it before him? <laughs> All right, who's the winner here? <laughs> so if, if, so we, obviously we did this really fast. 
and it, as you, if, if you actually have, if it doesn't work for you now, it's probably because you've done some, you've had some errors in typing stuff in. It gets kind of complicated to do this, and if you look, think about all this in scale, at scale, uh, it's kind of a, it, it's not that easy to do. And especially not when you're under time pressure to, to get it done like we've done here. Got it, Hugo? Okay, so does mo every most of you have have it working? All right. So, so the in in the interest of time here, we're we're actually right on schedule. Um, but in the interest of time, because we're going to go through the the Swift stack way of doing this now next. Uh, we can help you troubleshoot afterwards, and uh, we'll have a few people around to do that. So uh, if we can have, uh, start handing out the, the other handouts here. So this new this handout is uh, is for the Swift stack way of doing this. Uh, it's another VM that you that you can log into and you can deploy uh, Swift from ground up using our controller. While, while they're handing those out, uh, any quick questions before we start on the next one? Yes. How does this talk to Nova? Well, um, so object storage is really not a good fit for running a VM on it. It's, it's eventually consistent. So if you have, uh, in this case, we have three replicas, right? If you were to run a VM off of one of those replicas, you don't really know which one of the replicas the VM would talk to, which is problematic, because that's a constant stream of data going back and forth. Therefore, it's not a really good fit for running VMs uh, on, top of, on top of an object store. What you want to run VMs off of is, is a block storage uh, kind of system. What, what object storage is exceedingly good at, though, is to, to store lots and lots of, of unstructured data. And meaning images, documents. Uh, medical records, sure. Yeah, that's, yeah, log data. It could be anything, any, any file of any sort. Anything like that, yes. And, and it does so, and it stores it very durably, meaning that, you know, like losing data is virtually unheard of in, in an object store uh, unless you make some very serious mistakes. Um, but, and, and it does very well with, with high concurrency, meaning, you know, thousands and thousands of users at the same time inputting and uh, getting data out of the system. So in terms of the use case for Swift, um, I notice we have uh, one of the Mercado Libre guys here um, sitting in the front row. They have taken Swift and they're using it for their uh, application, putting images at 1.5 1. 1. 5 1. 5 billion images that they're serving. Yeah, so, and they have massive concurrency of tons and tons of users hitting their site all the time requesting data. 
from it. So that's where, where, where Swift really, really shines. Uh, and it's a really good backend for brands too. Right, so in... Yeah, so the, 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 the comment was that it, what, what it's also really good at is actually serving up images, VM images, to Nova that then can be used and put onto block storage to run it off of there. So you can make templates of VMs and store them and then you call them up when you need them. That's a very, very common uh, use case for Swift. So everyone have the handout now? Um, have you been able to log into the, the next VM? Okay, cool. Um, first thing we will want to do is, actually, I need one of the handouts. I just realized. Yeah. There we go. What you want to do is you want to start going to workshop.swiftstack.com and you want to log in with the, um, the credentials. This is Swiss Stack Credentials. It's uh, username WS1 one, one something or zero something. Uh, and the password is just password again. Um, once you do that, you should see a screen similar to what I have. Um, you can call this new cluster we're going to create just workshop. Uh, because we're only going to be using one VM here, we don't really need a partition power of 18. That's complete overkill for this. So I'm going to set mine to 10 uh, across both of these, both for the object and the account container. I suggest you do the same. And I'm going to hit Create Cluster. Let's take me, oh, okay, I already have one, great. Um, Now I'm going to log into the other one here. So, the password is also password. All right, so if you've gotten your workshop running here, what you will do is do a curl command, HTTPS, workshop.swiftstack.com slash install underscore Ubuntu. If you can do a little bit bigger. And you will pipe that to bash. What that will do is it will run a command on the node, which will install uh, Swift from ground up, all the open source bits that we know and love, as well as some Swift stack um, monitoring agents and deployment tools. So if you run that, whoop, helps if I spell that right. Workshop. There you go. You should see a bunch of packages install. It will take about a minute. Once you get those packages installed on your VM, you will get a claim URL. It will show up at the end of this install.
All right. There's my claim URL at the bottom. Does everyone get that? Cool. Now take your claim URL, paste it in up there in your address bar. And the controller is now linking up to that, uh, that node. You'll see here that you can claim this node as normal, as not being a replacement of a node. If this was a, a node that we had previously used, it would actually recognize the node and know it, and it will import all the settings from it. Um, but we go ahead here and just claim node. It will contact, uh, establish a VPN connection to the node that we installed it on. This typically takes 30 seconds or so. At the end of this, you should be getting a green bar like that. And you can go ahead and claim the node. Now, the node still isn't in a cluster. So we want to add this into the workshop cluster that we created. And you can go ahead and add the node. And you will see the node as unprovisioned down here. And then you can click on ingest now. Here's the zones that we talked about earlier. Um, we're going to only have one zone here. I'm going to accept that as the default. And at this time, we're almost there. We have already uh, almost gotten this node added into the cluster. The last part we want to do is we want to actually go take a look and configure these drives uh, and the, the, the networking of it. Because we're only, um, we're only using uh, one network here, I would set these to just use the, uh, the public IP address. So I'm just going to pick my ETH0 address, and reassign the interfaces. And then I'm going to click on the manage drives. So here you will see uh, the five different drives that are attached to this, this, uh, to this node as well as the OS drive, which is going to probably be at the bottom of you here. What you then want to do is uh, make sure that you ignore that drive because we don't want to for reformat the drive that the OS sits on. So check the ignore button and click change. If you do this on a, on a regular, on a regular uh, hardware node, uh, it will actually detect the OS drive for you and ignore it automatically. Now, the, the next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we format all those drives, similar to what we did for the, um, for the original Swift node that we deployed earlier. We want to click Change. And so what this does is it basically goes through and it lays down the, the XFS file system on those drives and, um, and it mounts them just like we did going through every single step earlier. And then uh, we can see that the label is now here, D0 to D4, as opposed to earlier we had D, D1 to, through D5. Um, now, what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to add these into the account container and object tiers for the ring operations, which will basically uh, map the drives into the ring properly. So you can go ahead and click the plus now button and then hit change. And that will take the weight of the drives that we discussed earlier. It will take all that, the weight and add them immediately. So that all the, the disks will be, the full weight of the drive will be added into the cluster. If this had been a, if this had been a, a new node we added to a big cluster, we may have chosen to add it gradually because what happens when you add a new node is the replication starts happening in the cluster. And 
if you have adding a lot of capacity to, let's say, one petabyte cluster, you add another petabyte to the entire, so you now have two, what's going to happen is that you have an almost full petabyte, and then you have a new blank petabyte that you're adding in, that's going to smooth out so that you end up having about roughly 50% of the, the one first petabyte moving over to the other one. Uh, that would require a lot of network traffic. So if you, if you were to do that, you probably want to add gradually. And what that will do is it will actually take uh, and add a little bit of weight to each drive every hour until you get to the full, um, the full uh, capacity increase. In this case, because we only have one, add immediately is a safe thing to do. All right. You should, should notice here that, that this will change to in use. And we're almost done. So if you click on the deploy here, we'll get to enable the node. So all the steps that we did in the first uh, run through of the, of the Swift node, this is actually being done uh, intelligently by our software here, the controller. Now, you'll notice here that there's deploy changes. One thing that we haven't done yet is um, adding a user. We can't create a cluster until we have a user. So the first thing we want to do here before we continue is to create a user. I'm just going to call my user demo and I'm going to have, I'm going to type password into password. And suggest you do the same for simplicity's sake. Now what you can do when you're ready is to hit deploy changes here. And that will actually um, oh, here's an IP, API IP address. Be good if I had that one in there too. Actually, when you uh, when you're in the configure cluster section here, because I had already configured this cluster um, to begin with, uh, this was not set up. But uh, what you want to do here is you want you want to use the IP address that uh, you logged into. So. In my case, that would be 166.78.181.204. Your IP should be different. The cluster API host name is not necessary here. We don't have D, um, DNS set up, so there's no need for that. Uh, we don't have a valid uh, SSL, so we don't need to use that either. So we can just scroll to the bottom and hit Submit Changes. All right, now we're good. So what you'll see on the pending configuration changes here is that the things that will happen when we push out the rings, so the rings have now been prepared. We haven't, uh, we haven't actually created them yet. So when we hit the deploy config to cluster here, what's going to happen is the rings will be created just like we did on the command line earlier, and it will add in the different disks that we just added on the node. And then this will be pushed out, the configuration settings will be pushed out to the node from the controller. So uh, since we're a lot of people here at the same time, this will take a little while. But go ahead and click the deploy config to cluster. And you should see a screen similar to this. And this job will probably take a few minutes. And while we do that, um, you can see here that the auth URL is displayed right there. And um, we also have a web console, which is uh, it's just a web console. You can upload, download uh, images, uh, documents, things that you have. And uh, it will also display the, the Swift version that, that this cluster will be running. If we had multiple nodes, we'll just repeat these steps, and we'll add them in one by one or we can add 10 at a time if we wanted to. So this will be, uh, obviously, be a lot 
easier to do than actually deploying everything by hand the first, like we did the first time. And, uh, well, that was pretty fast for me. Everyone else finish already? No problems? Okay. Um, we can go ahead here and open the console. That will take a little bit by the first time you load it. It'll take a little while to load the JavaScript. And then you can log in with the username and password. And we can create a container if you want. Call it Photos. And you can drop and drag and drop files in here. And again, you can use the, on the command line here, you can actually go ahead and use and do the same things as you did before with the other node, where you can upload uh, and download files directly from the command line as well. Does anyone have any questions at this point? have a photo here. Here's my Cloudcat. You can take these images, drag them to here. And they should be showing up there. Now, if you want to actually take a look on the command line, you can copy your auth URL. You can use the Swift client. And you can take a look at what's actually in this cluster. I have one container, actually not listing my objects yet, but I can also run a, a list. Show me the photos. I can list the photos that are in here. There we are. Does that work for everyone? All right. Any more questions at this point? Say again? The formatting on your on your disks, or is it pushing out the ring to the node? No, actually, you, you probably ignored the wrong one. Yeah, you probably formatted the wrong one. Okay. This is me. That's what I said initially. You should have uh, you should have another one in here. That's the one you want to ignore. How do I know that's the system disk? It's this one. How do I know? Um, it's because it says it here. That it's different than all the other ones. Okay. So you want to go ahead and change that, ignore. It would be better if we label that. Like yeah. In the, yeah. Something like this. You can format and mount that one now. Okay. 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 
Now we should be good. All right, there you go. And then you can add these in here. Like that. So these rings are being added to the object ring, right? No? That, yes, we they, they were just added to the object ring now that we corrected that mistake. Okay. So now they're in use here. Oh, so formatted and it became an XFS uh, file system. Exactly. Right? So the, the problem we had here was that he had actually ignored the wrong disk and it couldn't format it properly because of that. So um, now we got that sorted, it should be possible for you to push that out again. So in the audience there, how, how many people are sort of deploying OpenStack clusters? And how many people are developers? Who's, who's using OpenStack uh, in general like for deploying internal systems? How many people of you are actually planning on using Swift? Fair bit. Um, and how are, how are you going to be using Swift? Are you using it for an application? Or are you using it as part of an image store for, for Nova? Or anyone? Application? What kind of application? Okay. Any other? Object store for what kind of application? Just for cloud service providers. Okay. So similar to Rackspace. <laughs> Amazon maybe. The pages of what? Oh, uh, ebooks? Okay. Okay. Interesting. Any other use cases? Okay, so you're kind of doing an online reading experience? Interesting. Okay. Okay, that's cool. So w one cluster at Mercado Libre is actually running images, and the other one is more of a general purpose cluster. Yeah. Okay, so um, actually that brings up a good point here. Uh, if you take a look in your in your cluster here, um, you can actually go into the manage the cluster, and you can take a look at, for example, manage middleware. Um, there's a bunch of different middleware here you can do. You can set account quotas. On the, on the accounts, so you can limit how much data is being in, uploaded to a particular account. Um, you have bulk operations, which is kind of cool. You can take uh, like a huge zip file, for example, you can upload it and you can and auto unzip that as it gets uh, into the cluster and then you can take like an entire, let's say you had a, a website, you want to deploy like it's a static website. You could actually take the static website, you can auto deploy that onto the cluster and, um, and you can use the static web one to display all the data that's in the container where you uploaded it to and then have a, a static website that's really, really fast at responding because it can do a lot of uh, gets from you know, thousands and thousands of people at the same time.
Yeah, so, so, so if, if I understand your question correctly, is it, could, you, could you create a statically mapped object that then would be in your, be embedded in your website that would then link directly to your Swift cluster? Really, really small images, yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I have fully understand it, but I think that what, what you're asking is if, could you get the image to render automatically in a different web app? Yes. And I think that the answer there is that's more or less exactly what Mercado Libre is doing. So, yeah, so to, to, to that point, what we have here in the middleware, too, is uh, for people who are using Keystone, for example, you can, uh, you can go ahead and enable Keystone authentication. Uh, you'd have to set this up with your Keystone server, obviously, but there's, there's Keystone um, integration that comes in here that's easily uh, configurable, as well as LDAP-based uh, if you have an already existing auth system using LDAP, you can use that, and that could be used in your application to, to authenticate against various different uh, endpoints that you need to. Right. Right. So, so your yeah, your application would use the the store for for accessing the data that it needs, for example. Right. You had a question. Try to try to work with Swift Start. Yep. Do I need to have a public ID? No, you don't. So the question was, if if I work with Swift Stack, do you have to have a public IP to so to, to talk to the controller? Yeah, I don't know what's the role of Swift Start. Right. So 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 the controller uh, can be hosted. We have a hosted product that we use. It's called platform.swiftstack.com. Uh, this is basically exactly what you're seeing here, but this is for just for workshops. But you can also have this on-premise, so they can sit in your data center, and it will can, you can have multiple clusters, and you can manage multiple clusters with the same controller. Yes, so you can use our hosted controller, or you can have it on-premise. And, and what happens is the, the nodes, your Swift nodes, they will be talking to the controller. They will connect out to the controller. The controller never talks to the node or doesn't initiate the con the, that uh, connection. The node con initiates the connection to the controller, and once it does that, then it allows it to talk to the node. And being able to deploy new nodes, manage the nodes, make changes to your cluster as you need to. Um, and, and deploy, for example, middleware, authentication, and so on. Yeah, so, so the, the, the question is, do, do I need to have a public IP to con connect to this? If you have this, 
the controller in, installed in your data center. You don't, but if you use our hosted, uh, no, you don't have to have a public IP on any of the nodes. Actually, we would suggest that you don't. Actually, strongly suggest that you don't because it's a security issue. Uh, what happens if you're using a hosted controller is that you initiate a VPN connection going out. And so, in one of the first steps that we did here when it said connecting to node, what actually happens is there's a VPN connection on the node that gets generated, it's a unique ID, it connects up to the controller and says, hey, I am node so and so, uh, let me connect to you. A simple side to side connection. Yeah. It, it's, it's not a site to site, it's actually node to controller. So every node has its own unique oh, okay. VPN connection okay. to the controller. Okay. Yeah. Great. And underneath that's using OpenVPN. And if, in case you're. Great. Your question out there. So does it do any deduplication? Is the question? Okay. Uh, no, it does not do any deduplication. However, um, there, uh, you know, if you want to use some kind of client-side deduplication, you can use that. Um, going forward, there are some uh, really exciting new features that are rolling into Swift. Um, the first one is going to be storage policy, which basically going to allow you to run multiple kinds of policies across. You could, for example, say, I don't need three replicas for certain types of data. I only need two or I need super fast storage, then you can actually deploy it onto to SSDs, which then would almost act as a kind of like a mini CDN, right? Um, and then after that, um, there will be erasure codes coming in, which will allow you to, uh, actually the, 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 the presentation that was here right before us, we're talking about the erasure codes uh, schema that's being implemented. It's being written uh, generally now by uh, SwiftStack, Intel, and Box. If you're familiar with those guys, so. So uh, bef before you, your next question, you had another question. Are we offering a SaaS product? We are offering the the controller as a SaaS product. Uh, but we are not, you know, you, you have to operate your own, you know, your own hardware, or, I mean, you can have another entity do it for you, but uh, you would buy your own hardware, and that's the, that's the point of, like, most people that, that need a private cloud, um, it's, it's hard to build a Swift cluster and maintain it and keep it up and, and monitor it and, and maintain all that stuff, so... That's, uh, that's something that you would put in your data center or your data centers where you can run m multiple regions if you want to and you manage that. But we help you do that through our controller. So, um, so the question is, if, what if something fails? Um, disks that fail, Swift works around that uh, based on the, uh, the handoff locations, like that we were talking about earlier, right? I was showing on the slides. So what happens is if a drive dies, you will see that in the interface here, that a, that a drive is not working properly. You will, get a, you will actually get an alert, kind of like this. You can get alerts. Um, and if, if you have a problem with it, you, you will know here by looking at it. If, if what? If, if, a demon. if a demon's not working? Yeah, yeah so, so what you can do is you can restart the demons on the, on the Swift node, but and we have, we have tools to allow you to do that. We do not manage your cluster. You manage your own cluster, but we give you all the tools to be able to do so. So back to you, you had a question. Can you explore the third pipeline for something? Yes, it can, it, it can support byte ranges. 
Other questions? Anyone here? This side is heavy weighted with the questions. This side is not. <laughs> How does it compare to GlusterFS? GlusterFS is more of a sort of a file system, uh, right, which has sort of object storage kind of bolted onto it. Um, it's a slightly different use case. Um, <laughs> well, you should always <laughs> choose Swift, of course. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that that's it depends on if you if you need a file system, um, your needs are probably different, and there are certainly use cases where ClusterFS may be a good match for your application. Um, I think in the particular use case that you t brought up before, I you know I don't really know a whole lot about it, but it sounds like that would be a pretty good use case for for Swift. So. content and everything. If oh, look me at that media mic. files are there, then maybe I don't know, but uh, I'm thinking GlusterFS maybe because it gives native interface into the shell and everything. But uh, if, if your documents, objects are very light in weight, but more documents, your application needs to scale. Well, so, so Swift scales really well, Yeah. right? Uh, and we've had many, today specifically, we had many, many use cases that were brought up uh, during the day, and in the keynote the other day, one of our customers, Concur, uh, they were showing how they were using Swift for for their application, and what they, you know, what they do is they have also millions and billions growing of images of basically uh, receipts that receipts, people scan. Basically, yes, receipts. And like Expensify and all that stuff. Yes, yeah. same same idea, right? Um, and so it, it really comes down to your use case. If you have lots of images, lots of small files, lots of high concurrency, that's a very good use case for Swift. And because Swift scales out, uh, linearly out, you can add, I mean, so far no one has really found a, a limit to how big it scales. Um, Rackspace, where uh, Chuck over at Rackspace was just talking about they have 85 petabytes of, of raw uh, cluster yeah, I know. in there. So they obviously have a lot of... I'm part of Rackspace deployment, so... I, I yeah, and, but Mercado Libre talked today about their 1.5 billion images. We have customers that we can't talk about, but they have yeah. s several, many, many, no, no, we, many, yeah. many petabytes I've seen of data. That, yeah. Um, and they're running it globally uh, across uh, different data centers, yeah. but are accessing it as one big cluster, which is, if you're, if you're running a web app, that is tremendously powerful because you can actually send requests based on the location of, of where the user is. So if you have three data centers, one in San Francisco, one in you know, London, and one in Hong Kong, you can, based on the user's location, you can send them to that data center and get the data back, right. which will then you know, reduce the latency of, of, of the request. Uh, two things which are coming to my mind. One is Swift Explorer. If something like you know, uh, that Finder and all that stuff is there on Mac, or Windows Explorer. So if we can write a simple app, that Swift Explorer, users will feel that it's a file system. Yeah, so um, actually I think I have maybe here somewhere. Or the shell, shell script, something like, you know, uh, instead of ls, Let's we see. can say sls, swift ls. Yeah, so, so there, are, um, th there, are, there are a lot of different kind of in integrations you can do. Obviously, the, the first one that usually comes to mind is authentication. Um, but uh, there's, there's always load balancing that is, is required for a, a big web application. Um, swift stack actually has a, a load balancer as we deployed it now. Uh, there's a load balancer that's a lightweight load balancer that's in, included that you can use out of the box. If you run a very large data center and you need uh, bigger kind of, low, have bigger load balancing needs, you can put that on top of it. Um, there's CDN integration that you can use. Um, there are CF, you know, 
SIFs and NFS gateways out there that you can deploy in front and get sort of legacy access Got that it. basically translates NFS directly into object. Yeah. And, uh, and then you do have file managers and file system adapters that, that can be used. Because They're, every time you want to run a curl command, people don't really want to do that. If you want to see the entire layout of your file system, it's a virtual field that they get, oh, I can see the data. Yes, but uh, that, that's probably if you kind of need a file system. If you, I mean, you can run with object storage, you probably don't. Actually, yeah. one of my colleagues back here has a, has a comment, yeah. I think. So I think, I think there's two aspects to that uh, question. The, the first one is that certainly there are uh, plenty of utilities that make it easier for you to just list files that, that are in containers and to you know, manipulate them at the command line. Um, you know, I mean, the, the command, uh, the Swift, you know, command line client is one of them, but there are, there are others that, you know, have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so having easy to use clients at the shell level is definitely something that, that already exists. It's a, you know, a solved, solved problem for Swift. Uh, but the other aspect of it is it depends on what exactly you're looking for. I mean, if you, um, you know, Swift is a, uh, a highly scalable, Object, distributed object store, and with that, you, you have to accept certain ideas, and one of those ideas is that it's, you know, going to stay at scale to billions of objects, you know, and, and, and millions of, of uh, containers and accounts, uh, and so you, there are things that you just can't get, and you, that you don't want, uh, and things like, oh, I want to list all of the accounts. Well, the whole way that, that you can scale to that level uh, is uh, it, it denies you the ability to to do something like that because you know um, y that's that's how Swift is able to 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 provide you with those services. So at some level you have to accept some compromises, which are you know that that I can't treat it like a file system at some level because otherwise you know you would just use a file system if that were possible. Um, so that's that's kind of the the the, the trade off. Now now that being said. Um, sometimes there are things you can do to, uh, like maybe you, maybe you know that you aren't going to have, uh, you know, a billion accounts or, you know, 500 million accounts or whatever. Uh, in that case, you know, maybe there are some ways that you can uh, get, you know, account listings. We do utilization uh, information, for instance, uh, uh, for, for Swift, and that, that is a place where we do, to some degree, aggregate account listings, uh, and you can get that. Um, through that information, but that isn't something that isn't going is to be provided for you like through a Swift API. So, um, so yeah, you just kind of have to think about the the compromises yeah. in, uh, involved in a distributed object store. I mean, it's a bunch of bash scripts only. Like, if the container has more than thousand entries or something like that, you know, there are more entries. I'm stripping off only. I'm displaying only up to thousand. If you want to see more than 1,000, then you have to pass an extra parameter, something pa like that. Paging, yeah. is, paging is something that uh, certainly yeah. Swift does already, uh, and, and that's fine for like object listings, but mm -hmm. uh, once again, when you're talking about things like uh, accounts, then that's a, that's a different story that won't be an API that you'll, you'll get out of Swift anytime, just because that, um, well, there, there's, there's a, a, you know, several technical reasons why you won't, you won't get that uh, for, okay. for account listings. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, just to highlight what Orion was talking about there too a little bit is that you know, uh, one thing that's very commonly uh, asked for among our customers is uh, billing and utilization data. Um, sometimes that's because you're, you're an ISP or something and you charge your customer based, you, know, you want to be able to charge your customer based on their utilization, uh, whether that is you know, the amount of data they store or how much they upload, uh, bandwidth and so on. Um, but it's also commonly used for, for internal chargebacks. Uh, so that is something that our controller is also providing you an API into doing so that you can query it for, for account and container data and uh, use your internal billing system to, to use, uh, to charge your customer or charge it internally as well. Um, but really, the, the, at the end of the day, uh, the number of applications and ideas that uh, people have for, for using Swift are just endless, and 
Uh, we see so many different kinds of use cases. We've highlighted a lot of you know images here today, but there there's like someone pointed out earlier, there are people just dumping all their, their log data from massive systems into Swift to be able to, to mine that data and look at it and store it and uh, for long periods of time. So uh, really it's kind of just up to imagination what you want to do with, with Swift and how you use it. Anyone else have questions? We'll be around. If you, uh, for the next few minutes here at least, if you have any problems or anything. Yeah, oh yeah, books, good point. <laughs> um, have you guys gotten one of these already? All right. <laughs> if, you, if you want a book, if you don't have it, just come up here and grab it. Um, this will walk you through, uh, this is our, our CEO, Joe Arnold, wrote this book. Um, it will walk you through a lot of the concepts of Swift. It will talk about things in painful detail. Um, you can go through it. You can build, uh, you know, a Swift cluster by, from from scratch. Uh, if you find that to be painful, you can always call us. <laughs> <laughs> this is the latest version as of now. Yes, there will probably be another version. Um, you know. Uh, global clusters was still on the idea stage when this book came out. Uh, global clusters was officially released like early, late summer or something like that. Um, sorry? I don't know, but I, I do know that they have their own homegrown object storage system as well. But. There, there, are lots of, there are lots of companies that are using Swift, very large companies, probably companies that you use every day. The, um, our, 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 uh, one of our guys who's the, the project team lead for the open source Swift uh, team, uh, he usually, his usually, he usually says that his goal is for everyone to be using Swift every day, whether they know it or not. So I think that's a pretty good goal to have. So, so if, if, you want to, if you want to try the Swift stack, you can get in touch with us. You can send uh, an email to contact at swiftstack.com. And uh, you also have Mario here somewhere in the room, I think, or outside the room. And uh, you can check in with him. He's our VP of marketing. And uh, we can arrange for you to have a, uh, a trial on our controller. And we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. What is the business model? So what is SwiftStack's business model? We basically. Uh, Provide the controller service for as a as a uh, as a product, and we charge uh, by the the petabytes used or the the storage used, the, the gigabytes used that you have. So if you how do we know <laughs> if you're if you're using our controller, you have you know there's usage data there. Uh, if you want to have an on-prem controller. Uh, we have basically a, an honor system, but you're you're supposed to report to us how much you're using. No. Yeah. Uh, we have a minimum tier. So you, so you, you subscribe to a tier, in, and then you pay for that tier that you're in. But uh, you know, usually people find that that is cheaper than hiring five to 10 guys who are really good at Swift. <laughs> so thank you.